Let's go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 17 through verse 26. It's a story that is powerful, that is full of amazement. And it's one I hope we all can relate to and be helped with tonight. How many of you need encouragement tonight? You need encouragement. I don't care how many times you encourage, you need encouragement. It is just what we need to survive at this hour. It's a critical hour in our earth right now. Uh, I mean, things are going on right now. And we're being set up for something that we need to be prepared for. We need to anticipate God being God and God moving. So Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, that's Jesus, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, a man brought a bed on a bed, a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him, Jesus. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tilting, a tiling in, into the midst before Jesus. They tore the roof off the sucker and let him down through the tiling. Verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear or awe, saying, we have seen strange things today. Amen. Verse 26, and they were all amazed from the subject. My goodness. Tell somebody, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Father, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think my topic is appropriate for the text that we've just read. The Bible said that they were all amazed, that they were in awe. They were filled with awe of the King James, or the New King James says, fear. When that paralyzed man got up off of that mat, they were like, my goodness. When you read this story, and especially if you're from the hood, and you heard something like this, you probably would say something like, good God. Good God Almighty. That's crazy, man. Man, them dudes were serious. Bro, he got some partners, but his partners were serious. Them jokers cut a hole in the roof. They let their homeboy down on a mat through the roof, my God, or oh my goodness, that's what I'm talking about. How many of y'all have heard all that and some? Now, <laughs> you gotta get this because what does the expression, my goodness, mean? Let me give it to you. My goodness mean, it's a phrase or an expression of surprise or excitement or even alarm. My goodness or my goodness, it's just the way you say it. It's like when you say, oh my God. How you said, oh my God, or oh my God, or my God. Now keep in mind, we're not blaspheming. 
But don't confuse this with blasphemy, as in using the Lord's name in vain. That's not what we're talking about. Oh, my God, oh, my goodness, is used by people of faith when they see what the Lord has done and they see what the Lord is doing. Oh, my God. Good God. So also you hear it when you see the way the things or the way people have changed. Some of y'all use it like that. You go, oh, my goodness, look at God. God, look at what God is doing. Or, oh my goodness, look how big that boy done got. <laughs> how many of y'all have gone to a family union and go, my God, what done happened to you? I, I went to, well, family union, one of my cousins came and I said, boy, leave them roids alone. My God, you done got big. My goodness. So this message is intended to literally lift up the spirit of everybody who will hear it tonight. Those of you that are watching at home, pay close attention, pay close attention. Try not to get involved in everything else. This is intended to bring a, a shout of surprise or excitement out of you as to what God is able to do and what God is doing. I actually um, need this message tonight myself. Uh, you know, I, um, I believe in, in, in helping people um, and I believe that when you help others, you know, you can receive help yourself. But sometimes uh, you carry a load alone. People have been asking me, I already told you last week, how you doing? And uh, it was again today, I was asked by three different people, how are you doing? And so my goal tonight is to preach myself happy. <laughs> Just to preach myself happy. I wish there was the, some way that I could just speak a word tonight that will calm every fear and, and lift every burden off of everybody under the sound of my voice with just this one word. I know it might be possible, might not be possible, but I can try. Uh, how many of y'all got one thing you just need to lift it off of you or one thing you need God to take and rouse, get it with them? them some, some of y'all, maybe I need to just stop right now and let you just come to an altar and lay it down. Because <laughs> some stuff God ain't taking from you. You're going to have to just put it off yourself and put off these things. And then there's some things, and again, you even know what it is. That's the crazy part, but you hold it on to it. When I said that, I went, how many of y'all got that one thing? You went, uh, well, you know what it is. I'm going to go over here because they didn't like that part. They liked it when I said tonight could be the night and this and that. But when I said it's your responsibility, they all just kind of shrunk and put their heads down because Christ has died on the cross. He have, he have delivered us. He have spoiled principalities and powers. He's overcome uh, the works of the devil and he's given us power. So I read from the Gospel of Luke, I read this very powerful story. The story shows us how our God responds to our faith and moves on our behalf. So these verses teach us how to expect God to move for us, even when our situation seems impossible, or even when we're faced with a hopeless situation. When our situations seem impossible, when we are dealing with hopeless situations. So let me take a poll. How many of you can believe with me tonight that God is willing and able to do something for you right now? Amen. That's just a poll. That he's willing and he's able to do something. Even that he's getting ready to do something. That there's a possibility that he can do something for you tonight. Isaiah 43, 19, put it like this. For I am, God says, about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? <laughs> Somebody said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will make a pathway through the wilderness and I'll create rivers in the dry wasteland. Yeah. Let me read it to you in a new century in another translation. He says, verse 19, look at the new thing I'm going to do. It is already happening. Don't you see it? I will make a road in the desert and rivers in the dry land. You, you may not be able to see it in the natural, but the question is, can you see it in the spirit? For we walk by faith 
and not by sight. Can you see yourself coming out of the woods? Can you see yourself swimming in rivers in a dry land? Can you see yourself being refreshed by God when there's no means of refreshment? Can you see yourself at peace in the valley of the shadow of death? Can you see yourself navigating life knowing that the good hand of the Lord is upon you and what's happening to you is just temporary? What's happening to you, you're just going through and that's what some of you are doing. You're just going through. But the beauty of that is that you're going through. And when you come out on the other side, you'll be able to look back and say, I came through that. I came through that. And I will go through this the same way I came through that. What didn't kill me then ain't going to kill me now. It should have killed me when it had me. But now I know God is able and he's making a way out of no way. He's putting a river in my desert. Ah, he's making a road out of the wilderness. So here's what God is saying. If you don't see how you going to make it, God says, I have the power to step in and make a way out of no way. Matter of fact, here's what God's saying. Here's what God's saying. God is saying, I want to do this for you. I want to do it. Then he says, um, I want to make something out of nothing. In other words, give God what you don't have and he can do something with it. No, no, give God what you don't have and he can make something out of it. Ain't that God? Out of nothing, he made everything. You ain't got nothing? Give it to him. Come on, you ain't got nothing? Let him have it. I, I, mean, I ain't talking about material stuff either. You ain't got no faith? Give him the fact that you ain't got no faith. You ain't got no friends? Tell him you ain't got no friend. He's a friend. That sticks closer than any brother. Come on, he calls us friends. So if you ain't got nothing, God, Nahilo, he makes everything out of no thing. He can make, now he called it those things that be not as though they were. You don't have nothing. You are perfect. You are right where you need to be. Little even becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. He can take two fish and feed 5,000. Can't he take your little loaf of marita bread with the mold on it that you got in your house and you're wondering how you're going to make it through the rest of the week before you get to the grocery store? You don't even go to Publix. You go to Winn-Dixie. You go to Winn-Dixie. And, the, and I don't know about y'all. How many of y'all shop at Winn-Dixie? How many of y'all shop at winn Nobody. How many of y'all shop at Publix? Anybody shop at Publix? Look at that majority. All Publix had all the Publix. I, I have. How many of y'all shop at Target? You go to Target and you, you go in there. How many of you go to Walmart? My, my grandson calls it called Walmart. How many of you do not go to the Walmart on 103rd. And that's all I need to know. <laughs> I, be, I mean, I ain't scared of nothing. I ain't scared of too much, but I'm, I'm scared of Walmart on 103rd. <laughs> and you need to be, you need to be, if you, you, you need to be too. God was manifest in the earth. Christ came to show us how what I'm saying is done, right? So let's visit a town by the name of Capernaum, which was known as the ministry headquarters of Jesus. When Jesus called his disciples, Andrew, Peter, James, John, they left their nets and they gave up their fishing business and followed Jesus and became fishers of men. But it was in Capernaum that he set up shop. He worked miracles. He performed signs and wonders. The city was on fire because of the presence of Jesus. People were in anticipation because Jesus was there. And sometimes you wonder why certain churches are not anticipatory and, and don't expect anything. Jesus ain't there. Jesus is not preached. Jesus is not, not taught. Jesus' name is not mentioned. Jesus is not worshiped. Jesus is not honored. And so when he's not there, you can't expect anything. But Jesus was in Capernaum and the city was in a buzz. The promised Messiah, who they were anticipating coming, was now in their town. And the move that they were waiting for was happening. In that special, there's nothing like living in the moment that you've been waiting for. Or living in anticipation, knowing that it's close. How many of y'all have been waiting on something and it's getting closer? 
It, you, you know that eventually it's going to happen. But it, you can feel some things happening. You feel the murmur. You feel you sense it. You sense ain't nothing like sensing that God has given me. You ever come into a worship service anticipating, sensing, oh, tonight's the night. Today is the day. You ever got up in the morning and say this? Now, you didn't just say it because it's in the Bible, but you said it because it's in your spirit. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And you got up and you went to work. You got up and worked in your garden. You got up and you cooked them eggs. Left some of the shells in them. Make sure you crack them good. Pop them open. But you did what you had to do that day in anticipation of God doing something. It was just a good day. It, it, it didn't have to be a perfect day, but there was something in you. And that's the way they are in Capernaum right now. Jesus is there. And there's something going on in them. And they're believing that the moment that they've been waiting for has come. People everywhere begin to spread the word that Jesus was in town and Jesus was working miracles. And today, again, we don't talk much about the miracles of Jesus. We don't. And so there's not much anticipation. There's not much expectation of even receiving a miracle from Jesus. We just like going to heaven, right? Nobody's preaching about the rapture no more. So you got people now trying to live their best life here because it's the only life they're going to have. But when you know that he's coming, come on, y'all. And I'm going to tell y'all, before it gets too bad, he's coming back again. Come on, the Lord is coming, man. Every eye shall behold him. So people everywhere begin to spread the word about Jesus. He was in town. He was healing the sick. Uh, he was coming, people coming everywhere, and everybody was in the expectation of a miracle. I, I don't know if it's just me. I don't know if, if I'm the crazy one in here, but I, I, for some reason, I skipped out here tonight. <laughs> because I believe, and I heard it in the worship, Jesus is here tonight, and I'm expecting something. <laughs> if you ain't expecting nothing, you may well go on home. With your crazy self. You, this, this ain't business as usual. I don't think it's going to be routine tonight. I don't think you're just punching the clock and trying to take a bunch of notes. Oh yeah, no, no. I believe that if you set yourself in expectation, I believe that if you anticipate something happening, I believe you may not see the manifestation in here tonight, or you may see it in here tonight. You may go home tonight and that thing is gone. You may stand up in here tonight and that thing is gone. Come on, you, you may look around you and he's gone. <laughs> where, oh, where are you tonight? <laughs> Why did you leave me here all alone? I searched the world over and I thought I found true love. You met another and you were gone. For some of y'all, you need to be praying that happened. I just counseled some people the other day, and the girl said, well, I got left. It was like a month before the wedding. He ran off with some other girl. I mean, literally, he ran off with some other girl. She said, I'm so happy. <laughs> Can you imagine that she married that joker? You just, you get this far and you leave. You just were blinded by the light. And so God opened her eyes. And some of y'all got to see this. Y'all got to see this. I, people everywhere begin to spread the word about Jesus. And I'm a part of this ministry just in general because I believe that Jesus is in this ministry. I, 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 if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. So I'm talking about the preacher. I'm going to leave that church. I'll leave too. I don't understand the people. Say, oh, I'm looking for the Lord. I need him more. Me too. You know, and I'm like, Lord, are you, you know, I want to be where the Lord is. And, and if my wife would tell you right now, if the Lord wasn't here, we'd be a member of somebody's church where the Lord is. My, I believe my wife, would, if she didn't believe I was real, if she didn't believe that this was the move of God, my wife would be at truth and love. <laughs> I also believe that somebody here tonight or somebody listening to me online tonight, I also believe uh, tonight that they have something that Jesus needs to fix in their lives. Amen. Let me get serious for a moment. Everybody has something that we need the Lord to fix in our lives. 
as, as, as a, a prophetic act, can we just take that thing and hold it up to God and say, fix it, Jesus. Fix it. And the song says, fix it, Jesus. Fix it like you said you would. So we got to see this. Look at Jesus. A healing machine. Mark gives more details than Luke. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Mark's account of the same thing. And we're going to see what happened prior to the healing of this paralytic man in our text. Mark 1, 32. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Good God Almighty. Jesus was in town, man. Them demons knew he was in town. And he started healing folk and casting out devils. And, uh, man, he was, every disease you can think of was being cured. And a lot of them were demon-induced and demon-influenced. And he said, y'all demons don't say nothing. Mark reveals Jesus as a healing machine. People that were hopeless and helpless, they heard that Jesus was able to fix whatever was broken in their lives. They were bringing them people, but there were other people in town that were getting word that this was happening, man. And they wanted to be where Jesus was. They wanted to get to Jesus. They believed it. And they were pressed to get in touch with him. And they pressed their way to get a touch from him. And, and, and so you, you got to see this. The whole city was witness to the miraculous power of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the next day, Jesus heads out to other towns. Mark records it. And he's doing the same thing. He's preaching and he's teaching and he's healing the sick. He's performing miracles. He's casting out devils. He's raising the dead. Everywhere he went, he was messing up the works of the devil. <laughs> For this purpose was the Son of God manifest, made known, came to earth that he might destroy the works of the devil. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Jesus said, for the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Lord have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to open blinded eyes, to mend the brokenhearted, to set the captives. Come on, set the captives free. Jesus is a healing machine. He's anointed to do good and to heal all that are oppressed of the devil. And the same anointing that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and quickens your mortal body. The same power that Jesus displayed after he rose from the grave. He said, I give you power over all the power of the wicked and power to tread on serpents, cast out devils, lay hands on the sick. I wish I had about 15 people who really believed in the power. You don't have to have it all together right now, but at least you ought to try. At least you ought to every now and then take some oil and say, God, I don't know if this going to work, but I saw it in the word and God, I'm going to lay hands on this crazy man. I'm going to lay hands hands on these children. I'm going to put all over the doorpost. I'm going to put all over the bedpost. I'm going to put all over the front door, the back door. God, when they go, bless them. I'm going to put all in the bag. I'm going to do because that all represents the Holy Spirit. God, Jesus was crushed. The oil flowed from him. And God, I want that oil to flow into the life of my family, of my people, on the people on my job. You've got to at least try it. When you get sick, claim the healing. When you're going through some stuff, decree and declare that Jesus has defeated the works of the devil. And he is your Lord and he is your God. You got to at least try. And as a church, we got to at least try we got to at least believe it. If somebody comes in here full of cancer, we got to at least pray that God would heal them. If somebody comes in here delirious, we got to pray that God would heal their minds. At least try. Tell somebody, at least try. And it ain't going to happen when you're sitting there like a gator by the lake or like a water on a pickle. You won't even praise God. You won't even worship God. You won't even summer. You won't even stir yourself up. You all dry it all up. Talking about loose here. That devil say, Paul, I know. 
Jesus I know. What you talking about, Lucian? Who are you? So here it is, through Mark's eyes, everybody and their mama is coming running to Jesus again because the text says he came back after going to those towns. Verse 1, chapter 2. When Jesus returned to Capernaum seven, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door from Jacksonville. The door. <laughs> While he was preaching God's word to them, Amen. there was no room in the house and even outside of the door pressing. There were people lined up trying to get in. They knew the things that he had done when he was there before, when I told you he was healing everybody. And so now this time he's back. So now they, they're seeing Jimmy walking they seeing the leprosy gone. They seeing somebody that was almost dead running, playing kickball. And they, they see them back in the fam the families together. They're worshiping together. They see this. So they come in anticipation, ready to receive. The expectation is high. The anticipation is great. Now, most miracles, I'm finding this out, because I used to always say, God does what he wants to, when he wants to. No, most miracles that are granted by God require at least require some expectation and some anticipation we see it in the story there's a paralyzed man who's laying on a mat who has to beg daily put there by his friends he was being carried by four of his friends four brothers and when they arrived the crowd was so thick it was so thick up up in the club that they get through no, no. <laughs> they, it was, I heard somebody say that the other day. So I went to the club. It was so thick up up in the club. And, and this is the house of Jesus was healing. And it was just so thick up in there that they couldn't get through with the man <laughs> laying on the mat. I'm trying to figure out who's been in the club right here. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. That was, too, that was too much. Mark 2, 3. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus. Look at this scene. Because of the crowd. But what's the expectation? What's the anticipation? I think that is kind of prerequisite. Maybe the man on the mat was his expectation. He was the one that was paralyzed quadriplegic laying on the mat I believe that brother said look here boys y'all get me to Jesus if you gotta tear the roof off the sun the last time he missed out this time he gets there and the place is packed he can't even get in now, what I say about church sometimes when we're in this building needs to be overflowing and people and stuff in here. And there's some people who really need Jesus, but all the church folk in here shouting and falling all over the chair. And the folk who really need Jesus can't even get in. Let me get back to the text. So the Bible says, Mark 2, 4. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above Jesus' head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. He can't get to Jesus because of the other folk in the crowd. But I'm sure you read your Bible enough to know how to handle crowds. People that get between you and the Lord. Y'all do remember the woman with the issue of blood. She pressed her way through the crowd. Remember that? If I can but touch the hem on the, of the garment. But everybody was pressing him and the crowd was thick. But she pressed her way. Y'all don't get it. Y'all do remember blind Bartimaeus. And they were following Jesus and thronging him. And Bartimaeus blind begged and said, Jesus! She, and they said, shut up. And Jesus said, bring him to me. 
Come on, you got to know how to navigate crowds. If you got to crawl through it, crawl through it. If you got to holler through it, holler through it. But don't let the crowd stop you. Come on, tell somebody, don't let the crowd stop you. You can't let nobody stop you from getting what you believe God has for you. Has there been anybody here or anybody listening to me that has ever let somebody stop you? Somebody say, shut up. Somebody tell you you can't get there. You, you, you'll never happen for you. It, it won't work for you. It didn't work for me. Just because it didn't work for you don't mean that it ain't going to work for me. You can do the same thing without favor. You can do the same thing without God's grace on your life. God has graced us to do some great things and everybody ain't graced to do what everybody else is graced to do. And you got to get that in your spirit. There's something that God wants to give you and if you can be in expectation and in anticipation of it and don't let the crowd stop you, don't let religion stop you, don't let what you don't know stop you, don't let nothing stop you but just keep on coming and if you got to tear the roof off, if you got to do something unusual, then you do that because there's something just for you so this man was paralyzed laying on the mat had to be carried by his friends Mm, but I hope y'all see something here. I want to talk to young people for a moment. He was carried by his friends. Young people. Don't like to hear what I'm about to say. Young people. Who your friends are could be the difference in you getting blessed or missing out and staying in the condition that you're in. Amen. I told you this story a hundred times, right outside this door. A guy who was a member of this church who had backslidden, was out there. I heard his story, felt sorry for him, had hundreds of dollars in my pocket, was gonna bless him with it. I followed him to the car, but when he got in the car, the window was down, the smoke oozed out, Three thugs, I don't call the boys thugs. I don't even know whether they were thugs or not. They were just weed heads. They were just, it was skunk too. If you ever smell skunk, and if this law passed, this recreational marijuana, you're going to know what skunk is. I was just in New York City at Rucker Park, and um, Ball had a kid I was looking at playing ball, possibly coming here to play for us. And I'm in Rucker Park, and they got some uh, skunk over here, some crank. Over the guy said, that's crank, that's skunk. And then it was just all kinds of flavors. And uh, I, I watched this boy play three games. I was only supposed to watch him play one, play one but I couldn't move. <laughs> My legs were heavy. I was hungry. I kept sending the kid over across the street to the delicatessen to get me something to eat. I got through with that and stopped the ice cream truck going down. I mean, I'm running behind the street. And I'm running behind the ice cream truck. Guy said, you all right, man? Yeah, I just want some ice cream. <laughs> so the boy was out there in the car, and I was going to help him, but when I saw the, who he was with, I put the money back in my pocket. You got to watch out who you're hanging out with. It can keep you from being blessed. So the parallel man hung out with friends, I'm almost done, who will believe in God for him. And we need that in our lives. Friends who often even want more for us than we want for ourselves. I have friends like that. I, 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 I like to consider myself that kind of friend. Well, I want to see you blessed. I want to see you better. I, I, want, I want more for you even than I want for myself. Um, how many of y'all ever thought, thank God for um, give you those kind of friends. Um, friends that are trying to figure out how to get you to live and get you blessed. Why well, they got their own issues. <laughs> they need a blessing themselves. I've, I've given to somebody and, I, and they said, man, I don't know, don't do that. I, I, it, they knew it was my last and I said, but it can't help me. You can't meet my needs, so it must be a seed. Just receive this. Not trying to buy friendship or nothing. You need it more than me. 
Now I'm going to take a little examination. I need to find out how many of y'all have at least had that kind of attitude where you can look at a friend and, and get a burden for them and, and do something for them that they need and, 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 and you have to do without because your friend needs. Got a nine bedroom house that won't let nobody spend the night. And you, buy, you live by yourself. What kind of friend of you. So here's the lesson within the lesson. I mentioned it Sunday. Your walk with God is not just you and him alone. You're part of a body. If not good, remember that man should be alone. Two is better than one, and a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. So when you're paralyzed by the things in this life, you need others to help you with your faith. You need somebody that can speak hope into you. My wife, and you know, I, I like to use her oftentimes because you just can't, I can't get nothing by her. I don't care. Sometimes I don't even talk to her at all. It's like, you know, I feel like them demons just shut up. <laughs> because if I come home and I start saying, well, this person is going through that or this person, I just left the hospital and, you know, and I was given the situation, she won't even think twice about it. She'd just be like, well, bless God. Well, we know how to pray. Let's pray. You know? And I'd be like, no, I'm trying to tell you the situation because I want you to feel sorry for me helping them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want you to feel me. I want you to like, no, I, this is what I did all day. I was helping my friend. Well, bless God, are they all right? Pick up your shoes. Out the middle of the floor. If, if you're that friendly, <laughs> help a sister out. <laughs> you helping them? Help me out. Your socks go. <laughs> Would you just get undressed coming in the house? But you need people in your life that will remind you that where there's a will, there's a way. So many of you right now may feel stuck, may feel paralyzed, may feel unable to advance, can't progress, can't move forward. And you may be wondering, when is my deliverance coming? Let me be that friend to you tonight, that voice to you tonight. Know this, as your pastor, I'm believing God for you. I'm believing God for you. For you. I believe I am sent by God to encourage you not to give up, to encourage you not to quit. I'm here tonight to command you, even that are watching, to keep the faith, to be steadfast, unmovable. I'm on assignment to help you see that God can make a way out of no way. I can't do nothing but tell you. I can't do nothing but tell you. I try to show you. But tonight, I know that words mean something. He sent forth his word and it healed them. He said his word would not return unto him void, but it will accomplish in the thing that which he sent it to do. I believe that if you are in anticipation and expectation tonight, that God can get down in your situation. If you'll hold it up to God, that God can move on your behalf. That the thing you fear the most won't come upon you. And even if it does happen, God will strengthen you and settle you and establish you and keep you. God will allow the enemy to come in, but he won't let the enemy destroy you. So many of you thought your reputation was ruined. So many of you thought it was over. But look at you right now. Uh, nobody even knows what you've been through. You feared for your life, but the grace of God protected you and kept you. God is that kind of God. And I'm supposed to just tell the potter's house and anybody that's listening, man, God's got your back. God is making a way out of nowhere. It's going to be all right. Weeping may endure for a night. Joy cometh in the morning. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you got the power to condemn. I'm trying to help somebody to see trouble don't last all way. I'm trying to help somebody to see God's got your back. It came to pass. And so I got to close. His friends took the roof off of the house. And they let that friend down through the roof. In a hole, through a hole in the roof. 
Now watch what Jesus did. Mark 2, 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. They wanted him healed. The paralytic wanted to be healed. But when Jesus saw their faith, he went a step further. Hope y'all see this. He didn't instantly heal the man. He forgave the man's sin. Which is, which is, which is greater, right? Why did Jesus do that? Glad you asked. So many people, when they come to Jesus, they just want to get to Jesus for the miracles, signs, wonders, and the physical blessings. They just want physical blessings. But I want to help you. Put it on the screen. Sometimes God wants to make a way in us before he makes a way for us. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> My goodness. Man, that, 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 that right there, sometimes he wants to do something in you. Come on, before he does something for you, before he makes a way for you, he wants to do something in you. He wants to change you. He wants to heal you on the inside. So many people, when they are in a tight or uh, st uh, stuck in a bad situation, they only want to do what they used to do. They want to get back and walk again. And, and some people want their their, their families back or they want their job back and they want they don't they want to work at the same place again they, they want to live in the same house again they they want this stuff given back to them god says how about something new yeah. isaiah 43 19 for i am about to do something new See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? What about a new thing? I'll do a new thing. What, what about the new thing? Why do you want to go back to the same thing that got you in the situation that you're in? It's like a drug addict, right? You want to get rehabilitated. No, you want to change. You don't want to get, re you don't want to get back to where you were before you got addicted to the drugs. You want a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new way of walking, a new way of talking. You want to be transformed because what you were before the addiction got you involved in the addiction you want to be somebody else you want to do something else behold all things you want to become new that's why it's great to become a Christian therefore if any man be in Christ he's a new creature all things pass away behold all things become new I'm not what I used to be I'm not the man that I used to be I'm better than what I used to be I'm new I am born again I need about 55 people that are born again you're not looking at popcorn no more you're not looking at the old me you're looking at the new me you're looking at the new me the new and improved me tell me y'all you people testify all the time y'all you even want but you wouldn't have liked me then I'm glad that man is dead we are dead and our lives are hid with Christ in God so you got to see this he, he said I see something. I, I, Jesus wants us to be totally whole, body, mind, and spirit. You, you, you know you can be healed. I'm going to say this now. Y'all got to hear it. You can be healed. You can be blessed. You can be physically sound and still go to hell. But when your sins are forgiven you, yeah. heaven is your home. Yeah, you got to see this. Jesus said to the man, your faith and the faith of your friends is, is what we would call in theology saving faith. There's a faith that saves, right? It's, it's just a kind of faith that saves you from your sins. There, there's a group, a, 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 a particular denomination in the church world that has uh, built a, a, a doctrine on this and kind of took them too far. But uh, they do say a faith that saves is a faith that obeys. Amen. And you take that from the book of James, where James says faith without works is dead. So Jesus is seeing the effort that they're putting forth. 
he sees the way the man's mind was made up in anticipation and expectation to be healed. And they see the faith of his, he sees the faith of his friends who get up on the roof and cut a hole, digs a hole, it's the clay, digs a hole in the roof and lowers the man down in front of Jesus. You got to see this. And if you just, if you just get your outside fix without your inside being fixed, when the next storm comes, you'll be right in, back in the same despair that you were in before. So something has got to happen on the inside of, 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 this, of this man. And Jesus knows that. My goodness. And that, that was, that was, that's, I'm thinking about that. For me, that's good. So when you get delivered spiritually and your sins are forgiven, there will be, listen to me carefully, I prophesy, no storm, no test, no circumstance. They'll be able to rock your world and shipwreck your faith in God. When your sins have been forgiven, when you have come to Christ, when you've been made spiritually whole, whatever betides, you know that God will. There's nothing that can take away you. I know too much about him. Somebody said you can't make me down. How many of y'all have already seen the glory of the Lord? My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And nothing is going to make you. Somebody say, well, what happens if you don't make it to the end, Bishop? What happens if you don't get high in the world? What happens if you decide you ain't going to serve God no more? I would have to have lost my ever-loving mind. And then if I've done that, God is so good and so gracious. He knew when I was in my right mind, I put my faith in him and I trusted him and him only. I'm going to go to heaven. Y'all can sit around here and talk about what happened to me down here. But when you get to heaven, I'm going to say, howdy, howdy. I beat you there. Or if you get there before me, I'm going to say, howdy, howdy when I get there. And it's going to be, the Bible said, 30 minutes of silence in heaven. 30 minutes. You know what that is, right? When some of us see some of us. You're going to be like, you mean to tell me I could have done that? <laughs> you mean to tell me I could have done that too? You mean to tell me? I... When our faith is in God. <laughs> All right, I, I'm, you can pray for me, man. Just pray for me. When our faith is in him for our fortune, for our future, then our current condition it's, it's just a light affliction. Come on, y'all. My goodness, somebody. That's, that's just too good to be true. That, now watch what happens. And then this is the end of it. He forgives the man of his sin. And then he calls his faith to action. Remember, faith without works is dead. Now that you're forgiven, son. I'm taking care of the inside. I need you to do something. Verse 10. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man. And says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Ah, his friends have been there for him the whole while. Now his friends can't help him with this one. You know why? They still up on the roof. They let him down. They couldn't get him down on the mat. They can't help him. He, they, can't, they can't help him. What does this mean? Put it on the screen. Your friends can get you in, but they can't get you up. You, your friends can't save you. Come on, your friends can't heal you. Your friends, they can get you to him. Uh, let me go. He had to exercise and demonstrate his own faith. You have to have your own faith. Look at what this man did, verse 12. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stoned, stunned, un, stone. Stunned onlookers. My goodness. Uh, Steve, this, this guy that always talking about my goodness. He's sitting on the front row in here tonight. I said to him tonight, I said, uh, I need a word. I've been at the hospital. I've had a luncheon today. I've preached two hours a day. 
And, and I've just been burdened. I've been in, I spent in the hospital last night, the day before that, the day before that, just nurturing a friend, loving on a friend, helping a friend, and, and, and just doing what I need to do. And I got back here. He drove me back. I was so tired from the hospital at five something this afternoon. I look at him and I say, I need a word. I said, just say something to me, anything to me. He said, my goodness. I said, well, my goodness it is. <laughs> my goodness. The, 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 the power of God, when this boy was healed, the power of God fell in that place. Verse 12 again. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. In Luke, he says it like this. And they were all amazed and they glorified God. And were filled with fear or amazement, saying, we have seen strange things today. How many of y'all are ready to see some strange things uh, even today? How many of y'all are ready to uh, be filled with amazement? Uh, be filled with awe? Uh, how many of y'all are ready to say, God, if you did it for him, good God Almighty, I know you can do it for me. My situation is not nearly as grave. My trouble is not nearly as bad. I've got the use of my hands. I've got the use of my feet. This man had no use of his hands, no his feet. But God, you healed him on the inside first. And then you healed him on the outside. And God, I need you to heal me on the inside. Even before you touch anything on the outside. Give me that peace that surpasses all understanding. Give me that joy that unspeakable. Good God from Zion, I need you, Lord, to help me out. My goodness, let me say this. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, let me say this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land and of the living. My goodness, look at what the Lord has done. Look at what the Lord wants to do. Are you in anticipation? Can you expect God to do something? Well, after he healed him on the inside, he said, now you do something. You take up your mat. You get your mat and go home. I'm saying to y'all, now that you have believed, now that there's something on the inside, now you do something. You give God some praise. You open up your mouth. You bless God right now. Come on, make it prophetic. You got to do something. If you tell God you need him, act like you need him. If you tell God you want him, act like you want him. If you need a healing, act like you need to be healed. Do it tonight. I ain't going to talk until you do it tonight. Do it tonight. Let God have his way. Hallelujah. Come on, let God have his way. Come on, let God have his way. Hallelujah. My goodness. Some of y'all, y'all to be ashamed of yourself. My goodness. Didn't you see how good God was to this boy? Good God from Zion. I've never seen nothing like that before. Good God. Let me say this. My wife and some people can remember this time. Who were with me on Seaboard Avenue? How many of y'all remember when that boy was in that wheelchair and, and the boy hadn't walked in, oh, and they said for years. And they brought the boy in and I was, I was really saved then. I was really saved. I just believed God, but I wasn't ready for what happened. I wasn't ready for what happened. That boy came down, they wheeled him in the wheelchair. I laid my hands on that boy. I prayed for that boy. And I, 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 I did, I said something really stupid. I said, get up out of that chair. And, and that boy, that, that, that boy got up out of that chair and went to walking. It scared me so bad. I ran and hid behind the pulpit. I started praying, God, what was that? God, I ain't never seen nothing like that before. But when I stood up, folk were leaping and folk were running and folk were dancing and folk were shouting. Somebody here tonight, you can get healed tonight. Somebody here tonight, you can get delivered tonight. And the rest of us will shout with you. The rest of us will dance with you. The rest of us will run with you. Come on in here tonight. 
Come on with your whole self. Come on with your burden self. Come on with your weighted down self. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. Hallelujah. Cancer got to be healed in the name of Jesus. Fibroids be healed in the name of Jesus. Tumors dissolve in the name of Jesus. Back pain, headaches, migraines. Come on, in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy, health, and life forevermore. Hallelujah. I believe. I believe. I believe. Hey. I believe God. I believe God. Healing coming. Deliverance coming. One thing about a church like this that lets you know you might be on the right track. The Bible said that God sent forth his word and it healed them. Some of you have sat up under the word of God so long that that word has permeated your very spirit, man. Your faith is so strong. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You ain't got no demons or no devils harassing you and bothering you. You ain't got nothing attached to itself to you. And if you believe that God has healed you and blessed you and God keeps you because of his word, why don't you take about 10 seconds and give God a shout in him? That ain't nobody rolling up here in a wheelchair. Ain't nobody got a monitor on their head. Come on, you ought to give God some praise that you're clothed and in your right mind. Come on, you ought to give God a praise that you're whole on the inside and whole on the outside. Ah, yeah, you ought to give God a shout that you ain't crazy. You ought to give God a shout that you ain't on an IV, that you ain't full of drugs. Come on, talk to me here. Give God. You don't need surgery tonight. You ain't got to go to the hospital. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. And you really ought to thank him if you were in the hospital, if you did have surgery, if you were giving up on. But look at you now. Look at you now. They said you weren't going to be here. They said you weren't going to make it. The report said you got cancer. The report said you got all kinds of issues. But look at God. You're still here. If that's you, take about 10 seconds and give God a shout. Give God a shout at it. Hallelujah. Come on, that boy picked up his mat. What you ought to do is pick up your feet. What you ought to do is open up your mouth. What you ought to do is lift up your hands. I believe in God for supernatural healing in my body, in your body. Come on, in your friend's body. My friend needs a healing. I lift my friend up to God. I left my friend down on a mat. I bring my friend to Jesus. Jesus, heal my friend. Jesus, heal my friend. Jesus, heal my friend. Heal him now. Blow the minds of the doctors. Make him whole on the inside and the outside. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. Have your way. My goodness. My goodness. How can you not shout after a story like this? How can you not shout? When you think about how good God's been to you. My goodness. What an opportunity we have as the people of God to praise Him on this side and to give Him glory on this side. Oh, that men would give thanks unto the Lord for His mighty acts and His wonderful works for the children of men. My goodness, it's just a declaration, a phrase, exclamation, 
that people use when they see what the Lord has done, when they see what the Lord is doing, when they are in awe or stand in amazement, or just think about the goodness of God. But when you see things that are happening that shouldn't be happening, and you know that things are going in the wrong direction and it seems like it's not going to stop. My goodness, how did we get to where we are? But in a positive note tonight, as I conclude this, my goodness, ain't God good. Hey there, this is Tiffany, and we are celebrating with you if you've answered the call of God on your life and have accepted his son Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, you are not alone in this new journey. We here at the Potter's House are here to help guide you on your new walk with Christ. If that is you, give us a call or a text at 1-800-TPH-4JAX. That's 1-800-874-4529. And let us know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We would be more than happy to walk you through your next steps in Christ. You can also put in the chat, I accepted Jesus, and we'll reach out to you for your next step. Now, if you're interested in becoming a member, we welcome you to the Potter's House, and you can do it right here online. If you're viewing us from your computer, visit tphim.org, and in the top right-hand corner, click the link, become a member, and fill out the short form. If viewing us on a mobile device, go to tphim.org, and in the top right-hand corner, select the menu bar, and then select become a member, and follow the prompts, and someone from our discipleship team will reach out to you. We thank you for joining us from wherever you may be viewing. And make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPHJAX so that you can receive alerts of when we're on the air.